Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we are so glad that you are here to join us this afternoon for this briefing on mapping environmental justice. How can you use EPA's EJ screen tool? We are very, very glad that we are able to hold this briefing this afternoon and to have someone uh, to present this information who has done this presentation many, many times uh, in an effort to really help inform people all over the country about this important tool that EPA has developed and, um, and basically started using or had ready to uh, began talking to people about to demonstrate last year. And this actually is part of a fulfillment of an executive order that was issued clear back during the years of the Clinton administration. So it is an important tool that has many applications in terms of helping EPA uh, be able to help its own agency as well as other federal agencies really have a better look at what is happening in terms of, of uh, impacts from uh, the, whether it's energy plants or other exposures to toxics, uh, to really look at some of the critical issues around environmental justice issues. What are those impacts? Uh, where are they? Uh, and this is a way that we can learn much more about that uh, with regard to thinking about states, regions, uh, communities across the country. Because we can all do a lot better job the more we know about what kinds of situations uh, everyone's constituencies are facing, what our communities are facing, and how we can do a better uh, job in terms of protecting both our environment but also really protecting uh, human health. And so to give us a demonstration about this tool, both what it can do, uh, how to use it, how you can uh, uh, make use of it in terms of helping to do your work and actually in terms of thinking about people in your organization, in your office, how you can all uh, make use of this to learn a lot more about what's happening in your state and your congressional district. Uh, we hope that this will be a really, really effective way to, um, uh, to sort of feel like you're getting on-the-job training and to uh, demonstrate this and to talk about what its role is and how it can be used and what you can learn and what you won't learn from it is Kevin Ulp, who is the Director of Communications for the Office of Environmental Justice at EPA. And Kevin has been at EPA for about five years and as uh, Director of Communications there is responsible for, for really overseeing the development of uh, EPA's website materials, a lot of stakeholder outreach uh, and engagement with regard to environmental justice issues. Kevin? All right, thanks, Carol. And thanks, everybody, for showing up today. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about EJ Screen, EPA's new uh, geospatial data tool for uh, analyzing environmental justice issues. And before I get into the presentation, I wanted to start off by playing a video, actually, to sort of uh, remind people of the very human uh, costs associated with environmental pollution and exposure and to understand the importance of being able to use a tool like this to be able to quantify and analyze those impacts and understand them when it comes to community involvement um, and analysis when it comes to rulemaking, uh, grants, and, and all sorts of different uh, uh, ways. So let me play this video. Hopefully it works. <laughs> I think for me, the moment where I realized or had an epiphany around environmental justice was after my firstborn son was born. Um, I was born and raised in a little village, I lived there pretty much my whole life. And um, when he was about four or five months old, he had an asthma attack. And I was a single mom, um, had no health insurance, no car, and I didn't really know what to do. Um, so I called my mom and I called my boyfriend's mom and she walked me through, you know, calm down 
get him dressed, get another bus, go to the hospital. Um, and we spent about two days in the hospital. And I learned that he had asthma and he was put on a nebulizer. Um, but it was incredibly scary. I was 21 years old and I was, I was upset. Actually, I was pissed. <laughs> um, I was pissed because I thought that I had done something wrong. I thought maybe I ate something wrong, maybe I exposed him to something. And so I started to want to understand why my son had asthma. And um, I talked to the pediatrician at the local clinic, and I talked to my parents, and I started talking to our neighbors. And what I found was that there was a lot of kids in our neighborhood that had asthma. Um, but what didn't make sense to me is when I would do my research, uh, Chicanos, Mexican-Americans in this nation don't have a very high um, percentage of asthma in children. And so it made me even push even further to try to understand why this was happening. What had I done wrong as a mom um, that my child had asthma? And in walking around my neighborhood and understanding where I lived, what I found was that there was a huge coal power plant um, about five blocks away from our home that was putting out um, a lot of air pollution. And as I started to do my homework, um, actually, ironically, at the same time, um, Harvard School of Public Health published a report about the two coal power plants in Chicago. Um, one is in Little Village and one is in Pilsen, the neighborhood right next door to ours. And what I found was that the part of the problem was the air pollution that, that was coming out of these smokestacks. Um, and I think what made me even more upset was understanding that these coal power plants did not power any homes in our community. They didn't power any homes in Chicago, much less the state of Illinois. And so we were bearing the brunt of this coal power plant um, for no electricity in our community, for no jobs in our community. Um, and it really riled me up to want to do something about it. So I went door to door with. So this is just to sort of provide a little bit of context behind what it's like to experience those types of pollution uh, and the impacts that can be felt, especially on young children and having to deal with that as a parent. Uh, the two power plants that she referenced, the Fisk and Crawford power plants in Chicago, were shut down in 2013. And um, the study that she referenced from Harvard University actually showed that about 160,000 pounds of soot came out of that, those coal-fired power plants every year. About 500 pounds of mercury came out of those power plants every year. And about 30,000 pounds of sulfur dioxide, which can cause acid rain and also create particulate matter that speeds up the process of asthma. And so when we're talking about coal-fired power plants, a lot of the times we're thinking about climate change and we're thinking about faraway impacts that will affect future generations. And we forget there are people that live in the backyards and the neighborhoods around these power plants that, as she's mentioned, are bearing the brunt of the pollution uh, in their communities. And so environmental justice is about making sure that uh, low-income and minority communities are properly protected and ensure the same basic rights that we all as Americans are uh, due access to. And the definition that we have at EPA uh, emphasizes fair treatment and meaningful involvement. And EJ Screen is really helpful in terms of analyzing fair treatment. It, are communities getting a disproportionate share of the burden of pollution compared to their neighbors? And also meaningful involvement. When we go out and talk to communities and understand their needs, we have to understand that a lot of the reason that uh, it's hard to reach uh, environmental justice communities is that they have different needs, they have uh, different uh, issues. And if we don't think about those in advance before we engage with those communities, a lot of the times they're lost and they're left out of the conversation about decisions that very much affect their lives. And I promise I'm not going to be on PowerPoint too long because these are really boring. And so when we're talking about environmental justice, we obviously want to consider environmental exposure. But it's also important to understand demographics. And, and why is it important to understand demographics? Well, we have two reasons that we want to talk about. The first is one that I think everybody here is pretty familiar with, and it's vulnerability. We already know a majority of the pollution that's in this country disproportionately exists in lower income and minority communities. It has to do with unhealthy uh, homes. It has to do with proximity to polluting facilities. It has to do with exposure to uh, uh, lead paint and, and other issues like that. Uh, so that's not anything that's particularly a surprise to most folks. But the other side of the coin that's equally important but often less discussed is susceptibility. And susceptibility is more biological. It's more intrinsic uh, to uh, ourselves in terms of when we do have environmental exposures, not everybody can react in the same way. And there's a reason behind that. Uh, so, for example, when it comes to asthma, we know demographically that lower income uh, communities and households generally have less uh, healthy houses. 
So exposure to molds, exposure to cockroach uh, allergens, exposure to dust mites uh, can all be triggers for asthma. And then if a child also lives in a community that's vulnerable, because every time he goes outside, there is a lot of heavy metals in the air from air pollution coming from coal-fired power plants, those cumulative impacts make those children much more susceptible to negative health outcomes. Another good example of this is with lead paint. We know that uh, children are very susceptible early in their life to lead paint exposure uh, and the effects from that. But we also know that children that have less access to healthy foods and uh, less nutrition are a lot more vulnerable to the negative health outcomes because we know that lead actually competes uh, with calcium in the body. And if the body doesn't have healthy nutrition and doesn't have a lot of calcium, then lead actually will stick to bones and stay and be absorbed more into the body. And so it's important not only to understand environmental exposure, but also demographics and the communities that we're in and why some communities have such negative health outcomes compared to other communities with different demographics. And so EJ Screen, a little bit of background, is EPA's new geospatial data tool for environmental justice analysis. It was released in June of 2014, uh, 2015. So it's been about a year now. Um, it's a web-based GIS system. It's really similar to Google Maps. So uh, if you've ever used Google Maps, it's actually based on Bing Maps, but nobody uses Bing, so I just say Google. But it, you don't have to download anything. You can zoom in, zoom out, you'll see it. But it, it's accessible. You can pull it up on your phone. Uh, so it's, it's pretty cool. It's a product of Plan EJ 2014, which was EPA's strategic plan to integrate environmental justice throughout the federal agency. Um, the tool was built heavily with the uh, support and uh, uh, academic assistance from the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which produced a 112-page report that a lot of the assumptions and, and uh, way the tools were built was based on those uh, decisions and uh, recommendations. And then finally, it was peer-reviewed in 2013. So we have worked with academic experts and got a lot of feedback and used that to make sure that the tool is being used in a way that uh, understands the restraints of the data, but also um, it, it can be made as useful as possible. So some of the key features in the tool, we have 12 environmental justice indexes, and I'll be demonstrating those soon. What those do is actually combine demographic information with environmental information so we know those places that are truly most vulnerable and susceptible, and we can prioritize those places when we're doing analysis at EPA. We update the data in the tool uh, annually, which is really helpful. So when you're using the demographic uh, data that's in the tool, it should be the most available, uh, best available data that's out there as soon as we refresh it. So we're going to be refreshing it and putting out a new version of the tool sometime next month, and that will have the most recent uh, data. It comes from the American Community Survey. Uh, so it's a sample of data that is recent to 2014 uh, for the next version. Um, all of the stuff that's in the tool is very easily accessible. You can get printable reports, maps, bar graphs. It takes really complex data and it turns it into something that's easily understandable. And I think that's one of the real powers of the tool. We have these data sets of stuff that's really important, like cancer risk and diesel exposure, but a lot of the times it sits in an Excel spreadsheet. And even if you can access it, then it's for census tracts and where are those? And being able to take all that and put it in one place and put it in plain English and in a way that is accessible is really important to expanding the conversation and, and allowing for people to understand uh, and have meaningful involvement. It's also based on uh, census block group data, and we'll show you what that means in a little bit. But basically, we push the data as far as you can go. Uh, neighborhood level data is very important because we know that uh, environmental justice really does change neighborhood to neighborhood, not every county is everybody demographically the same. There's lots of variation. So being able to understand where those populations are, sometimes of 600 residents, sometimes 1,200 residents, being able to get that high resolution data is very important. And then lastly, all of the data that's in EJ screen is available for download uh, for the public. So you can take the data, you can put it into your own tools, you can bring your own data into EJ screen. We try to make it as modular as possible for all of the people who use it for various reasons. It can be incorporated for different use and analyses. Uh, a few limitations that I always have to say before I actually go into the tool. Uh, EJ screen is a starting point. I like to refer to it as kind of like a uh, sifter. You know, if you're going out and panning for gold, uh, it, you run everything through it and it helps get rid of all the stuff you clearly don't need and what's left you can sift through but that's not all gold. You need to really look you can initially consider but it's not the end point. EPA doesn't use it as a basis for decision making. It just helps us when we want to get initial information so we can take a deeper look. 
It does help highlight places for further review, uh, but it is not a decision-making tool, and that's an important uh, distinction. Um, it's always important to realize that this data, because we're taking stuff that needs to be nationally consistent across all 50 states and have full coverage, that oftentimes there could be better state and local data. So before any decisions are made, it's important to understand the different options available, and if there is better data in local experience, it should be uh, supplemented in any decisions or uh, analyses. And then finally, lastly, it's important to realize that EJ Screen does not designate EJ communities. Uh, environmental justice movement started outside of EPA, so it wouldn't be our place to make those decisions. And beyond that, practically speaking, there's so many different things that uh, can affect communities in terms of environmental justice that we don't capture in the tool that it would be inappropriate to use this as a way of making designations for places that are or aren't. This is just simply a tool that can be used to see if there may be potentially environmental justice concerns in the area that you're analyzing. So I'm, I'm done with the PowerPoint now. So this is our website. And uh, you just need to go to epa.gov slash ejscreen. Um, we have pages here that are pretty useful for understanding how EPA uses it and how it was developed. There's more background here. I'm going to be clicking through a lot, and there's so much stuff to, to actually cover that if you actually want to replicate some of the things you're seeing today or learn how to use it. This uh, how to use EJ screen page has these little accordion files that you can sort through to find out how to do pretty much everything that you see me doing today. So uh, this is really helpful for uh, actually learning to use the tool. We also have a, a quick five minute video. So it's important to understand how to describe what EJ screen results do and don't say and learn the language. This five minute video I think is really helpful and walking through and being able to speak the EJ screen language. And then lastly, you know, this is great for all you technical experts. This is where the data is and, and more information. But we also have this additional resources page where we have links to our technical documentation, a fact sheet. Here's our full user guide. Uh, we have FAQ, and we have uh, a full hour and a half presentation on YouTube that you can view as well. And then here's links to other tools that are useful for environmental justice analyses that have been developed by EPA and other federal agencies. So without further ado, let me actually go to EJ screen. And so we're going to start out here in the United States. And you can zoom into any place. And since the video we were looking at was uh, in Chicago, we can start there. So I'm just going to, just like you would in any other uh, browser or uh, a mapping software, you can just type in. You can type in an address, you can type in a city, you can type in a state, county, and it'll take you to the resolution that you actually type. And so EJ Screen really presents data in two ways uh, that is most useful. The first is through maps, and that's helpful when you want to zoom out and understand a community and be able to zoom in on hotspots. Um, so that's good for uh, being able to look at the data one at a time. But if you know a place that you want to look at, say around a coal-fired power plant, say around a river that needs cleanup, uh, uh, any different site, you can actually map a site and then pull up all of the data into one easy-to-use standard report and get a lot of other information. So uh, I'll start off by showing you the maps because I think that's really helpful for understanding how EJ Screen works. And I'm actually going to pull up the power plants that we were talking about, the Fisk and Crawford power plants. So I mentioned to you sometimes the data is not as recent as possible. Uh, those power plants were shut down in 2013, but they're still in our system, actually, so we can look at them and understand how it can be useful to understand analyzing uh, power plants in the data that we have for, for those types of uh, work. So right here is actually the, uh, the Fisk power plant and the Crawford power plants located right around here. And this is the neighborhoods of Pilsen and Little Village. So I'm going to start off by going into the demographic information. So what we're looking at here is what are called census block groups. All these irregular shapes, there's about 217,000 of them that cover the entire United States. Um, they're defined by census. A block group is literally just a collection of residential census blocks. So we all live on a block. On average, uh, block groups are about 1,400 residents. Um, and we have census block groups that cover all 50 of the United States. So everybody here lives in a census block or another. And the data that's displayed is displayed in percentiles, which is really helpful. So it helps to understand, are the problems that we're looking at relatively common or rare? Or is the 
the view that we're looking at rare or common. So when we're looking right here at percent minority, uh, we can see that uh, all of the block groups that are in yellow are in the 80th to 90th percentile compared to the rest of the United States for uh, percent minority. So what that means is the percent of residents that are designated minority um, is higher than 80, or, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the rest of the nation. So in other words, only 10 to 20 percent of all the 217,000 block groups have a higher percentage of minority residents. The areas in orange tell us the places that are in the 90th to 95th percentile, meaning places where uh, they're in the top uh, 10th, or excuse me, 10th or 5th percentile. And all the places in red are in the 95th to 100th percentile. And so, for example, if I click on this block group, I can see that there is about 3,520 residents that live on all of the uh, blocks that are part of this block group. Um, it's in the 99% minority, uh, which is at the 97th percentile meaning there's only about 3% of block groups in the rest of the country that have a higher percentage of minority residents. So I'm gonna go through these one at a time. We also have low income here. We have linguistic isolation. Or, well, let me just say, we define low income as two times the federal poverty threshold. Uh, we have linguistic isolation, uh, which is defined by census as no one in the household over the age of 14 speaks English very well. And we can see there's a lot of linguistic isolation right around where the Crawford plan is. You see uh, percent uh, less in high school education. This is all adults over the age of 25 that don't have a high school degree or equivalent. And then we also have under age five and over age 64. And again, understanding susceptibility, we know that um, people, children under the age of five and adults over the age of 64 tend to have a higher susceptibility to air pollution and other types of contaminants. And so if we're looking at things like coal-fired power plants. This can also be very useful data. We also have this for all of our uh, environmental indicators as well. So right here, I'm clicking particulate matter. And I can click on any one of these block groups. Uh, particulate matter and ozone, the first two are more of a regional air quality phenomena. So you'll notice there's not much variation between the individual block groups. Um, that's because this is something that usually, you, if you go within a mile of any area, the air quality is generally pretty similar when it comes to PM exposure or ozone. So I can see here that um, the particular matter is 12.7 micrograms per cubic meter, which is at the 98th percentile. So again, it means that in terms of air quality exposure to uh, PM 2.5, only 2% of areas in the rest of the United States have an exposure similar to these block groups that we're looking at. So there's a lot of particulate matter that's already being dealt with by the communities uh, that are living in or around these facilities, near or around these facilities. We can see Overall, it seems like ozone is much less of a problem uh, in this community. You can see traffic is high. Again, when we, I want to take a step back actually and uncheck this for a second. And if we look at this, we can also, I, I should have showed you this, this is cool too. Everybody knows you have these different map features, but it's important in terms of just understanding a community, switching to a base map so you can see actually what is going on. We can see, for example, along the river, there's a lot of industry right here. And then there's a community here, but then we see there's a highway on the other side. So the community is literally couched in between um, I-290 and uh, the, all of these industries that are along the river. So again, now that we look at traffic proximity, they're seeing red along all of these makes a lot of sense. In fact, if I click on one of these block groups, we can see that about 680 cars pass by the average household uh, in this census block group every day, uh, which is in the 97th percentile. You know, only 3% of places have more than 680 cars that pass by their households in the United States compared to this location. So I have uh, lead paint. This is an indication of older housing, uh, but also uh, potential for exposure to lead paint as a stock of housing pre-1960. This is proximated to Superfund sites, and it doesn't appear that there is a Superfund site close to this area. We also have proximity to facilities with risk management plans. These are facilities that are permitted under the Clean Air Act to uh, be able to store large amounts of potentially dangerous or volatile chemicals, so they have to have risk and safety plans. We have proximity to transfer storage and disposal facilities. Uh, these are handlers and uh, movers of solid waste, landfills. And then we have proximity to major water dischargers, and these are um, going to be uh, people that are legally permitted to discharge large amounts of pollutants into the river. And we can see right around where the two power plants are, because they do have water discharges, those are a large source of water pollution um, in the river. And then we have what are called our EJ indexes. 
And so what an EJ index is helpful for is basically what we do is we multiply each one of our 12 environmental indicators by what we call our demographic index, which I'm going to show you now. And the demographic index is, is very simple. It's just percent low income plus percent minority divided by two. And that we use this uh, as the basis for understanding demographic vulnerability because the executive order 12898 for environmental justice specifically references these two populations as being uh, the, the federal government's primary duty to protect those uh, communities. And so uh, basically we use this as our proxy for understanding demographic susceptibility and vulnerability. We multiply this by each one of our environmental indicators to understand where are the places with the highest amount of pollution, but also low income and minority communities. So again, when we look at PM now, we see that the block groups that are lighting up in red will have both a very high exposure to particular matter, but also have a high percent of low income and or minority residents. So to understand that, I can actually click on this block group and I can see that the Again, the PM 2.5 um, exposure is at the 97th percentile, so it's very high. And then the uh, demographic index, percent low income plus minority divided by two is 92%, which is at the 99th percentile. So this would be a place that we would uh, probably look at more closely, understanding, uh, the, again, those basic principles of uh, susceptibility and vulnerability. We could do that for all of these, but you see uh, generally uh, where there's a lot of traffic, but also high low income minority populations, those areas light up red. Um, and we can go through these all the time, uh, all the way, but I'm, I'm trying to make it through and, and have plenty of time for questions, so I think you get the idea. We also have other map layers that can be really useful. And uh, these are in our map supplementary layers. So again, I'm gonna find exactly where those power plants that we were talking about are. So I'm gonna zoom in where I know one particular plant is and I'm going to go to toxic releases. I see a dot here, so I'm gonna click on that. And that's not it, that's the uh, Welsh Ready Mix plant. But here we have the Fisk generating station. And uh, that's useful for being able to see exactly where the facility is, but there's so much more information you can access here. So remember when I told you all of those numbers in terms of the total amount of heavy metals and other pollutants that were coming out of these facilities? We can actually see all of that right here in this uh, really easy to use and, and very useful tool. This is our TRI indicator. So what we're looking at here is total releases from just the Fisk power plant from 2003 through 2012. At the peak year in 2008, there was about 378,785 total pounds of just barium that was put out into the surrounding communities into the air. And it looks like there was just under uh, 500,000 total pounds we can see that uh, here there's 11,000 pounds of copper, 36,000 pounds of hydrochloric acid, 36,000 pounds of hydrogen fluoride. And we can also go through these one at a time. So I'm gonna just uncheck all of these. The ones that we talked about at the beginning, one of them was mercury. So let's go and look at that. Look at that, in about, in 2005, there was 125 pounds of mercury emitted from the power plant, which is a powerful neurotoxin that is very uh, much can affect the developmental uh, abilities of especially young children. So even uh, 100 pounds dumped in the community can have a substantial effect. You can look at sulfuric acid. You can see especially in these two years, 2006 and 2007, there was 13,000 pounds of sulfuric acid or 11,000 pounds. So you can go through this tool. There's a lot of information buried in there. You can also try to see water quality. We know that uh, there's issues with air quality, um, but what about the discharges happening in the river? And so I'm gonna go to map supplementary layers. I'm gonna go to water features. And now I'm gonna click on impaired streams. See, do these streams meet EPA standards for being fishable and swimmable rivers? So I'm gonna click on this uh, stream segment. Actually, I'm going to click on this one that's by the Crawford Power Plant. We can see that uh, the area that we're looking at, this is specifically the Chicago, I don't know what SAN is an abbreviation for, and Ship Canal. Anybody? Oh, okay. And, and we can see what the causes of impairment are. We have ammonia, anodized, we have dissolved oxygen, phosphorus, and PCBs. And so all of these make this river that's in uh, this community's backyard unfishable and, and unswimmable. It's not a safe river to swim in 
uh, for obvious reasons. And so these are uh, additional things when we're thinking about the totality of community and the things that they're dealing with. Also understanding that the water quality that's here is also uh, a problem. Another thing that's important when we're looking at the power plant is proximity for schools. That was something I mentioned earlier. While kids are playing outside, one of the things we never really thought about, a lot of us in the communities we grew up in, is, is the air quality actually harmful for us while we're running around on playgrounds? And so we know the power plant is right here. Let's see if there's schools nearby. So I'm going to go to places, and I'm going to get rid of this. And let's see where all the schools are. And we can see that within a, less than a mile, there is a number of schools in very close proximity to the power plant. You can click on it and see exactly what the name of the school is. This is an art studio. This is a uh, commenced school. This is actually an elementary school. And uh, this is another elementary school. So uh, we have under places schools. We have churches, which are also a good place in terms of if you want to do community outreach, uh, finding out where that data is. And we also have hospitals in terms of access to health care. This can be a good proxy. We can see there's not really a, a close hospital nearby. So there's a lot of other things in the supplementary map layers. We have transportation if you want to see where freight lines are or where airports are. We also have uh, tribal boundaries. We have areas to see are they in a uh, attainment for air quality standards uh, for different things like particulate matter, ozone, um, sulfur dioxide. We also have boundaries. So if you want to see the county boundary, if you want to see the congressional district, if you want to see the state, you can pull up those different boundaries. Uh, so we have a lot of other data that you can pull into the tool that's very useful for analysis. But uh, now I want to show you the reports, because that actually can be really helpful in, in terms of understanding a community. Now we're going to go over to Little Village. So if I'm doing an analysis, and I know the, the Crawford Power Plant I mean, just is right over here. Well, it's around here. Um, I, and I know that the area I want to study is right here. Then I'm going to actually get rid of this stuff and do an analysis of the place specifically. So one thing that you can do if you want to do just a circular buffer so you know the specific site, you can put a dot on the map. You can specify a buffer, so I want to make a two-mile buffer. and Just hit Add to Map. That's two miles. And, and that's two miles in every direction. What this is going to do is some, uh, add up the average of all the block groups that are within this circle and give me the average demographics and environmental exposure for every, all of those map layers you saw in one place. Sometimes you might want to do an analysis around a highway or a river so you can do a path or a trail so I can follow just doing a bunch of single clicks. And then when I finish, I'm going to double click. I can also add a buffer on either side of that if you want. But in this case, if possible, it's always best to actually specify the exact, exact boundaries of the area you want to look at. And so what I'm going to do is draw in a regular polygon. I'm going to start here, and just again through a series of single clicks. This usually always goes wrong, so I'm impressed that it hasn't. But... And then I'm going to just double click to finish. And so I can go explore reports as a good quick look at all of the data that we saw in one place. We'll start with demographics. And it takes a second to load. Takes two seconds to load. So while it's loading, um, all of the information that we saw, it sometimes will take a little bit to pull up. It can be uh, sh will show up in one place. So we have the demographic index. Uh, we have minority population, low income, linguistic isolation, uh, less than high school education, and and also another feature that's pretty cool is you can also now compare to the rest of the state, region, or U.S. So for example. And let's try that for environmental exposures. This isn't a great example because most of these pair. But a lot of the times you might see, for example, that PM 2.5 could be at the 40th percentile nationally, but at the 99th percentile compared to the rest of the state. And so what that will tell you is within the state, this is a very high value. But compared to the rest of the nation, it's not that high of a value. Another way of looking at it is I'm from Montana, right? And so if you want to look at uh, transportation or number of cars that pass by the average household, if the number is 150 or 200, that number might be close to the US average. But in Montana, that number could be very high. So it helps you get the sense of, is this relatively rare or common within my state, uh, as well as compared to the rest of the country. And sometimes it's a lot more useful to compare just to the state 
uh, for, your, for your need. So it gives you a sense of, again, that commonness or rarity, but at different perspectives. So we have all of that data here. You can check it. This is for EPA regions, which is less useful for people outside of EPA. And then we also have that for our EJ indexes as well. But what we can see, though, across the board is, is there does seem to be a lot of uh, particular matter is a particular issue. There does seem to be a lot of old housing in this area. There is proximity to a number of uh, facilities with risk management plans and uh, major water dischargers, which are both indicators of living near uh, facilities or industry. Uh, so we can see that there are things going on as well as uh, potential for demographic vulnerability and susceptibility as most of our indicators, demographic indicators, are, are high, around the 95th percentile or higher. If you want to get all of that information in one place in a report that's really easy to use, all you need to do is click this button, hit printable standard, or get printable standard report. You have to have patience with this too, but while that's loading, I'm going to pull up another report that is also pretty useful. So here's all the information for our um, EJ indexes that we saw. Here's the graph that goes along with it. If I go to page two, here's the map of the area that we pulled up. And then if I go to page three, I can get the actual raw data to interpret all of that and then also uh, you know, understand this a little bit more. Bless you. So for example, if I'm looking at linguistic isolation, I can see that it's 33% is the actual raw value. So that means one in three households in the area that we're looking at, which is 73,000 people, one in three households, no one over the age of 14 speaks English very well. Oh yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So all of the demographic data is from the same vintage and from the same source. That's from the American Community Survey. The data that we're using in this version of EJ screen, and let me actually go back to show you. It, we can see it's 2008 to 2012. The next version we're updating to 2010 to 2014. So it, it will, in the next version, be the most recent available demographic data available to the public. The vintage of the different environmental data sets does vary, and uh, that's an important thing to note actually so if i go back to the web page and i just go here we have the environmental indicators or demographic indicators if i click on environmental indicators i have the uh where it's from um what year that it was uh developed and where i can get more information on it and so these are all links to to that information as well so all of that information is detailed and if you want really explicit detail if you go to the uh technical documentation right here, that also has a lot of uh, really, <laughs> a couple of pages per environmental indicator, why we select a rationale for inclusion, um, you know, environmental effects, things like that. So the technical document uh, is also a really good resource. Let's see, where were we? Uh, and then so this is the, so basically this is the, um, one of the main features, the EJ Screen Standard Report, and it has all the information we've covered today. But I also wanna point out the ACS demographic report, because this is also very useful. Um, so we can see for the area that we've selected, which again, is just this community that's highlighted right here. The population is about 73,600 uh, residents. We have the um, population density. We're seeing the total number of households here and housing units. We also have, uh, Population broke down by race with extreme detail. Um, we also have information on educational attainment. And so this is gonna be really helpful because sometimes you'll see uh, a community that has 35 or 40% with a bachelor's degree or more, but you also see 35 or 40% with less than a ninth grade education. And so understanding the variability that exists within a community, is it homogenous, is it all the same, or is there a lot of differences within a community? It's really important for understanding context on the ground for a lot of different reasons. That's also true in terms of income. We have income levels broke down. You can see, for example, that it seems like 18,000, or excuse me, 18% 18 of households um, make less than $15,000 a year. 21% um, make between $15,000 and $25,000 a year. 34% make between $25,000 and $50,000 a year per household. 
to get a sense of what the average economic levels are and if there's, again, um, disparities or, or if it is relatively the same. So just a lot more um, demographic information that you can use. So uh, really understanding the potential for uh, communities in terms of doing community engagement um, and then also those questions about vulnerability and susceptibility. So that's basically EJ screen in a nutshell. I, I, there's a few other features I can quickly point out for those of you that um, do have other data that you have built out. You, it's very easy to add it into the tool. You just need to publish that in ArcGIS, copy and paste the link and hit add to map and you can bring your own data layers in. So if you have state or local data you want and you also want to access the demographic or environmental data and look at them side by side, you can bring your own data into the tool. If uh, you know about other layers that are already out there, you can click on this search available data, and we do have some map layers that are in here that you can get in terms of this is some better schools data. Here's the information about other um, hazard, uh, environmental hazard pollutant risk. Um, so just a lot of information that's available. But at the end of the day, I think this is just a really good tool as a starting point for considering um, environmental justice in a lot of different ways and understanding the real human impacts that are behind uh, the work that we're doing. And, and I think that story at the beginning really sticks with me in a lot of the work we do, especially with coal-fired power plants, to realize that there are a lot of people impacted by that, uh, by those effects, and we need to keep that in mind in the work we're doing, why it's so important. second largest metro in the United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. like behind the subway. It's the eighth most vocal in the state. The tenth most vocal of approval what you're doing. Um, are there any plans for the EK to bring these systems down? And that's a great question. Uh, we have translated some of the materials, including fact sheets and some of the pages into Spanish. Uh, it is a longer term objective to translate it. We have very limited resources. And there are real costs in between, um, you know, building another vi version of the tool that's in another language. Um, I think that's a point that's very well taken, and it's something that we have talked about. Um, th with this first public rollout and release of the tool, uh, we had about 250 requests for different features and functionalities, and we expect those to level out over time. And uh, I would say, you know, we we'll definitely work uh, to make future versions available in Spanish, and I 100% agree in the importance of that. And uh, this tool is not only about being able to find places where there's linguistic isolation so we can do translation, but also it should be translated for the very principles that it stands on. Hi, my name is Amy Schreier. I'm LLD in Ohio. I have just one quick go at a um, question on EJ screen and safe search. I don't know if I have any other comments or questions. Yeah, so see first is more of a... Uh, cumulative impacts or, or a risk uh, analysis tool. And so EJ Screen's really good as a starting point. We have a lot of data and it's really about being able to have user-defined areas and zoom in and get all of that. With C First, you have risk characterization profiles and, and you have the ability to go in and sort of tell a story and pull in pollution, pollutants in and, and analyze and what are those health effects and kind of walk through a series of steps to uh, talk about something more in depth. So we have used these things hand in hand. We actually have done presentations where we show how communities use EJ Screen to identify priority areas to focus on. And then they use C First to develop risk profiles and, and plans for action. So uh, they really do work well. And there is a lot of overlap in the data. But in terms of functionalities and the different ways to use them, uh, 
C first is a lot more for digging in deep and understanding things more. And EJ screens more about trying to understand everything that's out there and then zoom in on those places that are uh, uh, most affected or most impacted. And this is for the staff and for the presentation. I was just interested in how people are using EJ Screen. Are, are you guys actively using that as an, as a way to organize your data or like a motivation for how people are doing that? Well, it's been really overwhelming, honestly, and I think unexpected. We were excited to release it to the public, and we knew there would be a lot of potential users. In the first month, though, when we released it, we had over 150,000 users uh, access the tool, and we've had a lot of regular users uh, since then. And we, I, I've done presentations for every stakeholder group imaginable, um, so there's a lot of different users. Uh, we have had some big successes in working with FEMA to integrate the tool into their own geo platform, so when they're considering uh, cleanup efforts after things like Hurricane Sandy, they can target those places they know are most vulnerable, that have had the least capacity to weatherize and protect themselves from storm surges and, and other places that might have pollution issues that could be exacerbated by storms. So incorporating it into FEMA to consider em environmental justice as a, a, a layer of analysis was really important. We also incorporated the tool into uh, HUD's community development block grant tool so states can decide when they're uh, delegating funds for where um, uh, new housing and assistance is going. They can consider environmental justice issues. Uh, it's been used by states and local governments in a variety of different ways. It's actually been proposed in legislation in New York City. Um, and it's being used by community groups in a lot of different ways. In fact, we're working with climate justice experts that have been using the tool um, to just to pull in the demographic information to see where there is uh, communities that are less prepared and resilient and uh, ready for adaptation for climate justice issues. So they look at those, this information with their own data, and we're working with them on the next version of EJ Screen, which, as I mentioned, will be coming out in June, to see if we can't bring in additional map layers on climate change and uh, uh, climate vulnerability as well. So um, it's being used by EPA to look at places that we should be targeting for grants, understanding places that we should take a closer look at when it comes to enforcement and permitting efforts. Uh, there's been a lot of different uses and different purposes, and I think that speaks to what there was a real need to be able to access a lot of this data that is available by different federal agencies in a really user-friendly and uh, accessible way. Hi, I'm Jamie Thomas from Senator Sanders' office. Can you um, go back to what you just said about resiliency? Is there a chart where we can look at climate vulnerability? That's what we're working on right now. And there's a lot of great uh, federal agencies uh, that have developed tools on that already. And so we're looking at where we can find uh, maps where we can see where there's potential for a coastal flooding, um, for uh, places where there are heat islands um, and uh, heat vulnerability. Um, we're looking at places in terms of a, a lot of different indicators. There's hundreds of maplers that have been developed, and we want to really narrow that down. So I would say there is a lot of that data that's out there. You know, CDC Health, uh, Public Health Tracking Network has a great tool that I would definitely recommend you look at. Um, that's the CDC Public Health Tracking Network. And they have a, a abundance of data that um, they have these things. So you can look at a heat vulnerability by county, and you can go from 2010 to 2020 to 2030, all the way up to 2080 to see in Texas or Florida how temperatures are going to change over the next 60 to 80 years. And, and again, understanding vulnerability in places to focus on that could be useful. So we're looking at places where it makes sense. Obviously, we don't pull everything under the sun into the tool, but those few map layers that are most critical for understanding will be bringing uh, into this tool over time. I have a few more questions for you, but it's fine. <laughs> um, so the other question I have, I was curious if you could pull up the report again where you can overlay the, I guess, the, the environmental data with the demographic data. Mm -hmm. And I guess you explain what the EJ index was because my understand, my previous understanding was that you can't overlay both like multiple environmental things like smog and water and lead and also see that in terms of uh, the demographic data. Yeah, and that is correct. Um, so each of the environmental indicators, you can only look at one at a time. Okay. But w these are pre-calculated, the EJ indexes. And so specifically how it works is we take the raw environmental 
indicator score, so say it's traffic and there's 280 cars that pass by the average household, every single block group in the United States has a number associated with that environmental indicator. We multiply that by what is our demographic index, um, we, uh, which, you know, in an area right here, we can see the demographic index is 82%. And, but actually, what, to be more specific, what we multiply it by is the demographic index minus the actual national average. And so what that means is that any place that's below the national average for demographics of 35 percent um, is not going to show up as a, a, an issue, because it, mathematically that'll be a negative number. Um, but anything above that, and the higher that the demographic index gets, that's a multiplier. Uh, so we understand both of those things together. And we have in the technical documentation an, a, a, an explanation about this. Again, I mentioned on the page we have this um, how to interpret a standard report. This five-minute video, I think, does a better job of explaining it than I'm doing right now. Um, but that's, again, just trying to understand those places where there is for that individual environmental indicator a high level of exposure or potential for exposure and as well as high uh, demographic uh, indicator as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for absolutely. Me. I'm interested in uh, is there any energy data for the houses? For houses? You mean for energy efficiency or yeah. that's stuff that we've looked at and unfortunately, you know, we're really limited by the data that's actually collected and this has been a great exercise for us because as a result, EPA is developing new data sets that we can incorporate in the future. Unfortunately, I have looked into that and there's nothing that has been developed at a national level. I would say though, the lead paint indicator, which is just stock of housing pre-1960, is a really good proxy for uh, energy efficiency because houses that's older generally uh, will have less uh, recently been built with insulation that's more modern or windows or doors where there's, you know, gap underneath. And so older housing generally or the lead paint indicator is a good proxy for understanding where there's um, energy efficiency or, or not. Well, is there any list of all these tools? Well, I did mention on the uh, additional resources page, okay. we have, these are all of the EPA ones and, I, and we, we're putting more on here as well. Um, and th there's a lot of good stuff out there. In fact, we should be putting more of those things. The CDC Public Health Track Network has, is a great tool. Um, HUD's developed a lot of good tools about healthy homes. Um, and if you're looking for any specific data and you have a question I, afterwards, uh, I'd be happy to help you to um, point you to people or, or uh, websites that might be useful. Uh, Kevin, I wanted to ask then to follow up on that. Um, when you were talking about, you know, that there that you're building out a variety of new data sets and everything like that, but there are certain areas where there just isn't information available. So, are you also like identifying those, bringing because it seems to me that this is a great opportunity to identify where there really is a lack of information that would be very useful, as as you were indicating, so that. Um, it's, it's very hard to, to um, uh, unless, unless we identify those gaps, to really get those issues addressed, and that that could be a, another great service that this whole tool could, could provide and could help other agencies in terms of thinking about and help Congress in terms of knowing here's where we really do have some very important information gaps um, to make sure that that gets followed up. I mean, I think that would be very important. And then the other thing would be, as you were saying, to really expand the list of other, like, cool data information, like the CDC or the FEMA maps or whatever, if they're not going to be able to be layered into this, but so that there really is a comprehensive list. And then if we could make sure that the different agencies are kind of also providing the same sort of information, including EPA's EJ screen, in terms of their various platforms so that we really get it all coordinated. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So I have a few thoughts on that. Uh, first of all, in terms of data gaps, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, uh -huh. And uh, I'll keep most of those to myself. I think there are a lot of places <laughs> well, where we can cool. constructively work to uh -huh. fill, fill gaps. Um, and sometimes 
it, it happens for different reasons. I mean, for example, there are very regional issues. So if we're mm -hmm. talking about mountaintop mining, if we're talking about uh, CAFOs or controlled animal feeding operations, those are more regional. And so the mm -hmm. data set does exist, but we don't have it in as an environmental indicator because it's not nationally representative. But we are looking for other map layers. So when we talk about you know these map layers, these supplementary map layers, when we're looking at places and transportation, water quality issues and sites, um, we're, we're looking to bring in things like CAFOs and, and uh, other places where we can find data to bring in for those more locally useful issues. Um, in terms of data analyses and, and gaps, um, yeah, I, I, not, I don't want to share them now because it's controversial, sure. but that's a long conversation. Sure. Um, and it is complex, but I think the federal agencies are doing a better job of responding and creating these. You know, we always kind of lag five years or 10 years or more behind the private sector on some of this, but I think agencies are rapidly putting a lot more resources and there's always so much stuff happening, it's hard to keep track of it. Um, we absolutely will make a commitment and it's one of those things on our list that we're doing as a part of the update to add a lot of other tools that are out there in federal agencies to our list on our website. So that's going to be published shortly. And I think we're also trying to do a better job working in, when we go to conferences and talking between agencies that we present these tools together because this tool can be really useful when you use the HUD AFFH uh, tool that has a lot of data about housing and, and uh, where public housing is and uh, access to affordable transportation and uh, you know those types of issues. When we're talking about community things, we need, we, it's really important to get out of our stovepipes and understand the interrelated nature between a lot of these things. And I think it's something we're doing better at, but we still have a long way to go. Great. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, and we, and as I mentioned earlier to, to Kevin, we would be very interested in taking another look in a few months after you have new data and hopefully if, if you all are interested let us know because we'd be happy to have Kevin come back again and and go through more specifics and in terms of the new data and what it tells us. Yeah and can and I make a quick plug that. for that real quick? Sure absolutely make that plug. Sorry I'm sure that my boss would get so mad at me if I didn't do this. We would not want that to happen. No, you, no I wouldn't either. So when we're looking at the environmental indicators, what, some of the data that's missing that's really useful is this, what's called NADA data. It's the National Air Toxics Assessment, and that's a combination of air monitor data that we fuse with modeling data to understand each of these issues. So uh, we're going to be moving into the tool in the next version, diesel particulate matter, which is a, a very prevalent issue, especially when we're talking about goods movement and, and uh, areas close to heavy traffic, cancer risk, which is obviously very important as well as respiratory, and this is increasingly becoming more of an issue with wildfires and particular matter that is caused by that. And um, So all of this data is going to be included in the tool. There's going to be some other really cool features. You'll be able to zoom out. So right now, all you can do is look at block groups, but you'll be able to zoom out and get averages for um, what are called census tracts, which are larger units than census block groups, and zoom out and then look at counties. So not only can you look at within counties, but now you can look between counties to understand the differences between them. You're going to be able to have a save feature, so you'll be able to save multiple sessions, uh, which you can't do now. So there's a lot of really uh, great things. And the best thing about all of those updates is that we did a really intentional uh, push during the last year to get as many comments as we could to how we can improve the tool. And we received over 250 public comments. We can say 100% of all the changes that are made in the update were uh, requests from the public. So this has really been a collaborative uh, process, and I think we're trying our best to understand stakeholders' needs across a variety of sectors and uh, expand this tool to make it more useful in that way. So, One last comment that I had is, based upon this, what sort of collaboration or um, are you doing with NIEHS, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences? Because I could see in terms of what it could mean for driving some of their research and the kinds of data that they are gathering or want to do further analysis on that this could be a very, very interesting correlative effort. There's probably 10 federal agencies or, or offices in federal agencies we should be doing a better job of working with. We are working with a lot of federal agencies right now, especially in HHS, like CDC and ATSDR. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an area where we should work a lot more in terms of thinking about pairing this with academic needs and, and really doing studies that help advance the actual understanding of the impacts in terms of risk and exposure. Right, because so. this helps you know where some of those hot spots are, which could be very useful for them to think about where Absolutely. they need to drive research. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. 
Well, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank Kevin. Great job.